Linda. Ja, med oss har vi också Hanna Nordell från Svenska Penn och Jens Singmark från David Isläck biblioteken som ju har dragit igång den här, det här evenemanget i Sverige. Jag ska strax lämna över till dem men vi ska också säga god morgon till dem borta i USA. Good morning to you in New Jersey. Trisina Strong, BB, Martha Hickson and Amy Penwell and very welcome to our webinar and thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. Nice to be here. We're so grateful to have you. So Jens, Jens and Hanna, maybe we can uh, listen a bit more to, to your introduction and tell us a bit more about the Swedish uh, band Looks Week. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, and thank you so much, Linda, for for the invitation. I'm so happy to uh, be here together with Jens and also to our uh, American colleagues. We are eager to to listen to your testimonies on what's going on. Um, I thought I would like to begin with just saying a few words about uh, what Swedish pen is and uh, for those of you who don't know us yet. And I will then leave uh, the word to my colleague Jens at the David Isak Library who will talk about the library. Um, so uh, Swedish Pen is an organization that works with freedom of expression. And we are a part of a global network of centers called Pen International. Uh, there are, uh, I think, around 150 Pen centers across the world. Uh, it was started in London in 1921. And Swedish Pen was one of the first centers uh, that joined in 1922. So yesterday, uh, last year, <laughs> we celebrated our centenary. So, um, so it, when you think about Pen, um, you think about primarily writers. But Pen is a members organization, and we are uh, we have members that work within the field of literature. <laughs> And that could also mean uh, librarians, that could also mean translators, uh, editors, and so forth. Uh, in Swedish Pen, we have uh, more than 1,000 members, and we are one of the biggest centers in the network. And we work a lot with international solidarity and advocacy work uh, for freedom of expressions in different countries. Uh, for example, in Turkey or Belarus or Iran or China, uh, we work with uh, individual cases to support imprisoned writers. Uh, some of you um, might <laughs> have heard about Nargis Mohammadi, uh, the Peace Prize winner uh, of um, this year. Uh, she is one of the imprisoned journalists and writers that we have been working with for some time. Um, and what I think uh, has happened in recent years in Sweden is that we can see that many of these issues that we have been working with uh, on an international level are also moving into a Swedish context. We will probably talk a little bit more about that, but just to give you a few examples, uh, we see an escalating um, rate of threats against uh, those who write. Um, we see uh, a polarized democratic conversation or polarized conversation that uh, perhaps is not something that um, you desire in a democratic society. Uh, and we see some sensitivity uh, around children and youth literature. And uh, we have been in Swedish pan, we have been working uh, for quite some time to figure out a way for us to be in conversation about freedom of expressions with colleagues across Sweden in a, in a way that kind of makes sense. And for us, uh, Ban Books Week uh, has uh, uh, come out to be one of those uh, ways for how we can be present in the uh, in conversations about the threats against freedom of expressions. Um, I will talk a little bit about more what Ban Books Week is, but before doing that, uh, I would like to leave uh, the word to Jan Singmark. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's very nice to be here and uh, uh, especially to listen to you, Martha, Tristina and Amy later on. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jan Singmark. I'm a librarian at the David Isak Library. Uh, we're situated in Malmö, in the most southern part of Sweden. And uh, 
The WT Sark library is a freedom of expression library, and we collect and make available books that have been banned, forbidden, censored, or otherwise systematically uh, silenced. And we make these books available. Uh, we're a public library. We're connected to the National Library Catalog. Uh, so all our books can be checked out and borrowed as they can in any other library. Uh, but working like uh, with this particular topic, censorship and freedom of expression, uh, for us at the David Isaac Library, it's important for us to not be just for the experts and the scholars to get anything out of it uh, to visit us. So uh, we we want it to be uh, easy to understand and to for it to be feel relevant and interesting for everyone. Uh, so in every like book that have been banned or censored that we have, we put in a note on the inside that explains a bit uh, to just get the gist of why has this book been banned or what happened to the author and so on. So here, for example, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. I can read that this book has been uh, banned. Uh, and uh, it's been banned in the most southern states in the US since 1852, uh, preceding the uh, American Civil War. It's also been banned in Soviet Russia. Uh, and today it's uh, controversial due to the uh, black stereotypes featured in this book. Another American example is Flamer uh, by Mike Curato. Uh, it's been banned and censored because of the uh, perceived sexual content and oh, because of uh, the LGBTQ theme. Uh, and this has been banned throughout uh, schools and libraries in the United States since uh, 2021 and onwards. So th that's what we do here. Um, and to segue this into what we're doing with Banned Books Week Sweden and like the big question like why talk about banned books and censorship in Sweden, a country that's perceived to have uh, very liberal ideas and liberal democracy and strong freedom of speech? Some might ask that question, but uh, like speaking from a librarian's point of view, I think uh, it's important to uh, showcase Banned Books Week in Sweden uh, in some way preemptively. Uh, so we as a profession and a society can have the tools to have these conversations when facing threats and uh, attempts of uh, undue influence uh, from uh, the public or politicians. But it's also a matter of right here, right now, because uh, I think it was last week, uh, like the biggest union for uh, librarians in Sweden, they presented a report that uh, said that uh, they did a survey and 28% in the survey said that, that uh, and all the respondents were librarians. They said that they have experienced attempts of undue influence from either the general public or by politicians. And 18% of these responders uh, say that uh, they have to some extent made adjustments in line uh, with the attempts of undue influence. So they have changed their maybe what books they should have in their collection or what kind of uh, literary events they can host and so on. And uh, according to the um, report, this has to do with uh, religious books, books with LGBTQ themes, and nonfiction books about climate change, and also books on written in other languages than Swedish and English. Uh, there have made, been made attempts to have these books removed from Swedish libraries. And we've also seen during the last year, uh, many threats and debates uh, regarding Drag Queen Story Hour, which is very sad to see. Uh, so so that, that's kind of a small background to why we think this is important to work with even in Sweden.
uh, and uh, what, what we some of what we're offering uh, for Band Books Week Sweden, uh, we're of course very influenced by what you're doing in the United States for Band Books Week there. Uh, but for it to be relevant for people in Sweden, we need to have like a broader perspective, a more global perspective on uh, censorship. So we have made, put together a list of over uh, 100 titles. I think it's close to 200 titles of books that have been banned or censored from different parts of the world. Uh, so it could be books from the United States, the UK, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Nordic countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, uh, and so on. Uh, and to keep it in line with the philosophy of like not having to be an expert, we have also written a few lines on every title uh, where you can write, uh, read why and where this, uh, this book has been banned. And this information can be used for our participants uh, in the Banned Books Week uh, to make uh, displays and showcases on the books we have uh, chosen. Is there anything you want to add to that, Anna? Um, yes, perhaps. Um, uh, I want to add that um, as a part of us uh, arranging this Band Books Week in Sweden, we have joined the Band Books Week coalition in the state. So we are in constant dialogue with our with our friends uh, in uh, different organizations in Pan America, in ALA and so forth. So uh, not doing this from scratch, but learning from our colleagues has been a really important part of, of the work. I've seen I saw some questions about why not the same week. I'm going to address it straight away. Um, we were thinking about this. Uh, and this year, it uh, collided a little bit with the book fair in Gothenburg. So it was a practical reason. But also, I like to think that we are, you know, taking the baton after it was uh, ended in, uh, in the States uh, on Sunday. And today, Monday, we are continuing the work. Uh, continuing the work of our colleagues. So um, we will see how we do it next year and we will look forward for you know engaging with feedback from the different participants in Sweden uh, if this was a good choice or not. So let's keep the discussion open. Um, and I, I want to also say that for, for, for us it has been important that we um, I mentioned this in the beginning that we are working together with uh, schools, with libraries, uh, with bookshops uh, across Sweden from the south to the north. Uh, right now I'm sitting uh, in the storage facility at the local bookshop in, in Uppsala at the English bookshop, uh, one of the participants. So I've been here uh, taking a look at the wonderful work that they have been doing. So. Um, this is a very par important part of the Band Books Week Sweden, that we are present in different rooms across Sweden where these uh, conversations about uh, freedom of expression is taking place. Yes. Um, uh, so this is one of the books that we are working with, uh, also from an American context, The Hate You Give. So we have given it like uh, this kind of graphical um, a book band <laughs> so that you can recognize it in the displays and the stores here uh, and uh, I think what uh, Swedish pen also brings uh, to this um, to this work into this uh, situation of knowledge exchange is the situation on uh, for forbidden books and freedom of expressions in different parts of the world so by being in contact with our colleagues in pen centers uh, across the globe we have you know, ears on the ground in different places uh, across the world. And I think what we also have to realize that, yes, it's important to work with Band Book Sweden because things are happening in in, in Sweden, you know, that, uh, that scares us perhaps or that worries us. But we also have to uh, acknowledge that Sweden is a part of the world. We are connected. You know, if, uh, if uh, information is restricted in the States or if you know, we can see what happens in Russia when people are deprived of their access to information, where books have been banned, uh, where the word peace is forbidden. You see what happens when, because then you lack the possibility of making democratic choices. Uh, it's, uh, and it affects all. So we, we have to see that we are, you know, this global perspective. I think it's important to realize that Sweden is part of the world. Uh, yes. 
Um, so I wanted to add that. Uh, perhaps just something about what's happening this week. Um, I, yeah. I think the best way if you're you're listening and you want to track what's happening in, in Sweden, I think it's uh, going to the hashtag Ban Books Week Sverige. Uh, we have asked the participants to to share what's going on. So, but take a look, you know, at the at your local library, um, at the, the bookshop close to you, yeah. or things are happening. I think this year because we had uh, not so long time for preparation. So I think what people have been do doing this year is primarily to work with like the graphic material, but also to think about those formats and platforms that you're already working with. So for example, uh, book, book circles, book clubs, uh, this kind of events where you can take we can choose like a, a, a forbidden book and you can you can read it together so i think this year it's uh you know the simple formats uh the thing that everyone can do within the platform that you have but, but, but it's so amazing to... it's so amazing sorry hannah to, oh. <laughs> to see what, like uh, what our participants have put together during like this short time i think we started to like uh, telling people just before summer uh, like please be a part of this and we can see like in Luleå, in the northern part of Sweden, they're doing like this big concert with newly written music. And they have host talks on the topic of censorship and freedom of expression. And the schools are doing like book clubs and talks and lectures. Uh, and people are doing like, like pub quizzes on the topic of banned books uh, and so on. So it's very amazing to see uh, this activated. Uh, I think maybe we can we can stop there. Uh, yeah. We look forward to your questions later on. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Jensen Hanna. So we're moving to to Martha Hickson in New Jersey. Please tell us a bit more about what you're doing there. You've been a school librarian for for quite some time, I understand. I have been a school librarian for quite some time. I'm going to share my screen as I tell you about the length of time I've been a school librarian. Uh, there we have it. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Great. Thank so you. I have been a school librarian. Uh, this is my 19th year as a school librarian. I started in 2005 and there I am when I'm fully awake. <laughs> uh, it's very early in the morning here. Um, and as my colleagues, Amy and Tristina and I were discussing how to talk about the situation in New Jersey with you. We decided to um, take a somewhat uh, organic approach to the nationwide wave of book challenges in the US and tell you um, how it arrived in New Jersey, sort of exactly as it happened. And it started two years ago with me. That was our first awareness that this was something big and something going to happen. So I'm going to tell you about me <laughs> and what happened to me. And then we'll broaden out a little bit. And uh, Amy will talk to you about what we've done um, as a state organization. And then Tristina is going to take it uh, to an even bigger picture for you. So we'll, we'll go in that direction. Um, so I'm going to start with the situation that I faced uh, two years ago, almost to the day. And before I dive into that, I have never had the pleasure of going to Sweden. I hope to someday. And perhaps some of you have never had the pleasure of coming to New Jersey. So I thought I'd just get you oriented as to where we are. So here we are, that little red blob there in this map of the United States. Uh, we're not far from New York City and Philadelphia. We are one of the original 13 colonies of the United States home to about 9 million people today. We are the most densely populated state in the country. We're known for our beautiful seashore, our tomatoes, our blueberries, and best of all, from my point of view, our pizza. <laughs> um, we do have a connection to Sweden. Um, between 1638 and 1643, Swedish settlers established uh, the colony of New Sweden, along the Delaware River in South New Jersey, where they built Fort Elfsborg uh, in what is now Salem, New Jersey, and that fort protected the settlement. And in that area is to this day, a town known as Swedesboro. Uh, it hosts the large, the oldest 
standing log cabin in the United States built around 1640 and King Carl Gustav visited Swedesboro in 1976. The story I'm about to tell you though takes place about a hundred miles north of Swedesboro about 90 minutes driving time in a rural county called Hunterdon County where I teach in the town of Annandale at North Hunterdon High School. So moving forward uh, my story begins on September 28th, 2021. And on that day, I was sitting at my desk in uh, my office in the library and my principal arrived in my office, a fairly rare event, <laughs> at lunchtime while I was reading the New York Times book review to tell me that he had heard a rumor that there was going to be a complaint about a book at that evening's Board of Education meeting. I asked him which book. His response was Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe. Uh, that is a memoir, as you may know, in graphic novel form about growing up non-binary and asexual. I quickly pulled up the excellent reviews of Gender Queer, printed those out for him. I also handed him uh, a copy of our library book selection policy, which had been followed in procuring that book a copy of our materials reconsideration policy, which outlines what to do if uh, a community member has a complaint about a book, and a copy of our uh, materials request uh, form, which the members of the public are to complete if they wish to challenge a book. Uh, that At that point, I had been a librarian in that school for 17 years, and never had we had to actually use that uh, policy before, the re reconsideration policy. It had never come to that. Uh, previously, any concerns about books were always handled through a conversation um, amicably. So I thought he was well equipped for the board meeting and I went home and watched the board meeting via live stream, much as we're doing right now. And I was stunned by the turn of events. Um, when it came time for public comments in the board meeting, a group of parents stood up and indeed they did object to gender queer. They then objected to Lawn Boy by Jonathan Epison, which is a realistic fiction novel about a young uh, Mexican American man. The New York Times compared Lawn Boy to, uh, called it uh, a uh, catcher in the rye uh, for uh, the 21st century. September 28th of 2021 happened to be right smack dab in the middle of banned books week that year. So once the parents were done complaining about these two books, they then went on to complain about banned books week and the fact that the librarian had put up a display of frequently banned books in the library. And they called out a number of the books in that display. Two Boys Kissing by David Levithan, Being Jazz by Jazz Jennings, Beyond Magenta by Susan Cooklin. And if you're keeping score at home, <laughs> you will note that every book title I have mentioned so far has LGBTQ plus themes. And then to wrap it all up, they finished their tirade by calling me, Martha Hickson, by name, a pedophile, pornographer, and groomer of children in a public meeting that was videotaped and has now been viewed more than 5,000 times on YouTube. Throughout all of this, the Board of Education sat silent and despite the defamatory claims against me, they uttered not a word. Meanwhile, at home, I was a quivering mess of nerves and anger. It was not pretty. The next day I returned to school fully expecting that the principal who had come to my office in panic would be returning to my office uh, to make a plan for what to do next, but no contact from him. Two days later, the assistant superintendent, my principal's boss, uh, walked into my walked into the library and in front of my coworker and students said to me, you sure stirred up trouble, and then demanded to know how I paid for the $10 uh, coffee gift card that I was offering to students as a prize in the Band Books Week contest I was running. Uh, side note, I paid for it out of my own pocket. Three days later, my vice principal to whom I report called me into his office and demanded to know how books with language like that could be in a school like ours. Um, when I 
continued the conversation and told him I was concerned about the lack of information coming in my direction regarding the situation at the board meeting, he, his response was, we are under no obligation to communicate with you. So that sort of set the tone <laughs> for the way things were going to go. And it continued in that vein for quite some time. Finally, at the end of that week, I happened to run into the principal in the hallway. And I asked him if any formal challenges had been filed to the books that were discussed at the board meeting. And he said to me, not yet, but I expect that we'll be talking about books. I then asked, will there be any action taken against me? And his response wasn't exactly heartwarming. He said, there's nothing planned. So I flipped it up on his head and I said, will there be a statement made in my defense? And he said, why would we do that? And I said, well, you could assert my integrity, my performance and the professionalism I have demonstrated for the last 17 years. And his response was chilling to me. He said, we won't do that. Uh, the administration remained in that mode, actively accusatory and antagonistic throughout this ordeal. And I would say that is still, <laughs> um, the subtext of our relationship to this day. In any event, in the days following that conversation with the principal, the parents involved here actually filed objections to a total of five books, which you see displayed on the screen. In addition to Lawn Boy and Gender Queer, they filed a challenge to Fun Home by Alison Bechtel, another graphic novel memoir. Uh, this book is Gay by Juno Dawson, a nonfiction uh, sort of health and uh, safety uh, instruction book and uh, you know, self-help book for young LGBTQ plus kids. And then All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson, a uh, memoir about growing up black and gay in New Jersey, actually. All of these have LGBTQ plus themes. When those challenge forms were submitted, they continued the defamation against me. At the top of this slide, you can see that this challenger claims that Martha Hickson is guilty of distributing pornography. Uh, and very quickly, hate mail started arriving at my school email address. Here's an example at the bottom of this screen where I am told that I am truly sick and disturbed. Uh, while all this was coming in, um, additionally, I was being shunned by some of my coworkers, some of whom don't speak to me to this day because they believe what they heard at that board meeting. Uh, some of the students uh, who were aligned with the parents began engaging in nuisance vandalism in the library, intentionally seeking out books on LGBTQ plus topics, removing them from the shelves, hiding them throughout the library, or turning them backwards on the shelves so that uh, the spine would, would not be visible. Uh, in addition, social media kicked in and uh, I started to be trolled on social media. This, by the way, continues to this day. Anytime I uh, present in a public setting, write an article, I'm interviewed, the trolls come out to attack. And these are some of the things they typically say, repeating the groomer pornography claims, they throw in domestic terrorists. Uh, I'm disgustingly diabolical. I should be fired. I'm such a pig. This is the kind of stuff that pops up repeatedly. They even attempted to file criminal charges uh, with the county prosecutor's office and the local police department. Fortunately, neither of those agencies gave their um, claims any credence. Um, meanwhile, while all of, all of this was happening, the district's policy requires that when a challenge is filed, that the district form a reconsideration committee, and that committee is tasked with reading the book, in this case, all five books, in their entirety, and then making a recommendation to the Board of Education whether the book should remain in the library or be removed. While that reconsideration committee was forming, I was forming my own posse. <laughs> Um, I, I was enlisting community support. So I reached out first and foremost to my union. We are fortunate in New Jersey to work in a state where uh, teaching staff can be represented by a union. So I reached out to my union for help and uh, some of the coworkers with whom I was friendly and who were still supportive 
of me. Uh, I reached out to students via our, our school's uh, Gender and Sexuality Alliance clubs, which are helpful to our LGBTQ plus students and their allies. Uh, my brother happens to live and own a business in the community where I work. So through him, I was able to reach residents of that community. Um, I am friendly with a number of parents of students who have gone to the school in the, the time I've been there. So I reached out to them. I also had a group of community supporters that already existed because of a censorship situation I had faced in 2019. They formed into a group called the North Hundred and Voorhees, that's the name of my district, intellectual freedom fighters. So I reached out to them and said, we've got another problem, I'm gonna need your help. And of course, I reached out to my amazing colleagues in the New Jersey Association of School Librarians, two of whom I'm with this morning, uh, because I know I can always count on other librarians for help. So that was the, the group I assembled so that, oh, in addition, I reached out to the professionals. Um, for most of us librarians, hopefully a situation like this is going to be a once in a career uh, episode. But there are people on this planet who have vast experience with these issues. And uh, so I reported the situation and asked for help from all of these folks, some of whom uh, Hannah has already mentioned, the American Library Association. Of course, PEN America has been fantastic. Uh, through all of this and done tremendous work. The National Coalition Against Censorship, uh, our National Council of Teachers of English has taken a very strong stand against censorship. Every library is an amazing political action committee here in the US uh, that has done terrific work. Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Red Wine and Blue is an interesting organization. They call themselves um, a national group of suburban women, although you don't need to be suburban or a, a woman to be a member of it. If you're familiar with the notorious group in the U.S. called Moms for Liberty, Red Wine and Blue is kind of the anti-Moms for Liberty. And then, of course, I mentioned uh, my colleagues at the New Jersey Association of School Librarians who have uh, eventually... Uh, the end of my story created a, a rapid response team and amy's going to tell you more about that but professionals can help well with all of this activity by the time of the next board meeting in october a huge crowd of people showed up typically at one of our board meetings there might be a handful of people if anybody uh, at this one, there were about 400 people, the vast, vast, vast majority of whom were there to support the right to read versus about 30 of the book banning crowd. Uh, on this slide, you can see an example of one of the comments that a supporter of the right to read made. In fact, this supporter of the right to read in the rainbow mask <clears throat> is my sister-in-law, Denise. And this is part of the statement uh, that she read at that October meeting, uh, emphasizing the fact that these these books are here for kids to read voluntarily. You don't like it, just put it down. Uh, and then on the other side of the slide, you see an example of the type of rhetoric displayed by our book banners. Now, the highlight of this and the meetings that were to come was the speaking done by our students. Um, Dozens of kids came to these meetings, stood in line to speak to the Board of Education. Some of them were nervous, some of them were scared, and it showed, and actually that was effective. It showed to the board how incredibly important this issue was to the kids. And despite their nerves, they stood up for what they believed in. They were amazing, passionate, eloquent, they were models of public discourse. They followed the rules that are set up by the board for public speaking. And sadly, some of them left the microphone in tears because the people holding the placards, proclaiming their faith in Jesus Christ, jeered at these LGBTQ kids as they were speaking. I, however, was not at this October meeting. I was watching from home via live stream because days before this meeting, I suffered what I now know to be a stress-induced breakdown at work. Um, my husband was called to pick me up. I was crying, couldn't speak, had trouble breathing. My blood pressure had gone through the roof. He took me immediately to my doctor who recognized that there was uh, something serious going on. She uh, prescribed medication for me, referred me to a therapist and wrote me out of work for a couple of weeks and said, you need to get away from the place that's causing the problem. 
Uh, and I wasn't the only one who was affected in a negative way. The bad behavior of the adults who were trying to ban these books bled over into the hallways of the high school. Uh, our LGBTQ students reported increased harassment, bullying. One even received death threats after he circulated a petition to uh, save the books. So things went on in this vein. October, November, December, and most of January, we continued going to meetings, talking to the board. And in the meantime, we had no idea what was happening with the reconsideration committee. There were no status uh, reports provided. We were in the dark for the whole time until late January. Uh, the agenda for the January 25th board meeting was published on January 21st. That was a Friday afternoon. And as I combed through that agenda, I found a link to this report, the report of the reconsideration committee. And their recommendation was that we keep four of the five books, but they recommended banning this one. This book is gay. And you can see on the slide there, rationale, I'm using that word loosely, for that recommendation. Now, this was a Friday night. <clears throat> the board meeting was going to be on Tuesday and the agenda for the board included a resolution for the board to vote on to ban This Book is Gay. I was not going to let that happen. I had personally checked this book out to so many students since the, it entered our library in 2015. And I know the value that it held for those kids. So I spent that weekend scrambling furiously to arrange speakers for the Tuesday night meeting. This was during COVID times, if you remember, we're still in January, 2022. So the meeting was held virtually, which was to my benefit. That meant geography was not an obstacle. So I reached out to alumni, even those who were out of state to see if they could zoom into the meeting. Students, parents, community members, librarians, I planned to speak as well. And then if you look at the cover of this book and the yellow bar, some of you may recognize a familiar name. Introduction by David Levithan, famous young adult author. He's also an editor at Scholastic. He's a, a native of New Jersey, and I knew he lived either in New Jersey or New York. And I figured somebody in my network must have a way to get in touch with David Levithan. And indeed, they did. So that Saturday morning, David Levithan and I emailed back and forth, and he agreed to write a statement for the board, and he asked only that a student deliver it on his behalf, and I made that arrangement too. So Tuesday, we were ready to go. We had all our talking points. We all delivered powerful messages, and when it came time for the board to vote, they disregarded their reconsideration committee's recommendation. They voted to retain all five of the books, and we won. <laughs> it was a great moment um, and because the board recognized that banning a book is an extreme action. And as board member Robert Kirchberger tells you on this slide, the bar for removing a book, if ever, should be extremely high. And they weren't going to take the bait. So all five of those books remain in the library today. In fact, they're part of my Banned Books Week celebration, although now I'm calling it the Freedom to Read Week. But what's happened since then? Well, uh, almost immediately, that group I told you about, the North Hundred and Voorhees Intellectual Freedom Fighters, sent a response to the board after their vote. And in that report, they outlined the flaws that we observed as the reconsideration process was executed, and we recommended improvements to that process. Unfortunately, the board uh, did, is not continuing to demonstrate the same wisdom they demonstrated in the vote, and they have taken no action on any of those recommendations. To date, we're still plugging away. In February, the board finally issued a statement. After five months of living under a cloud, they uttered three syllables and said that the claims against me were unfounded. Uh, also during that month, an article that School Library Journal had asked me to write uh, in November was published. And I naively thought when I wrote this article about what it's like to go through this that, oh, you know, just librarians are going to read it. Well, I was completely wrong <laughs> because that opened the floodgates. Um, I think I was the first librarian in the United States to actually talk about the fact that I was 
caught up in this. Many of us, and I too, were afraid to talk about it for fear of further uh, retribution from the community. But I, I had to think, you know, I'm fairly advanced <laughs> in my years on the planet. And I knew that my time for retirement would be coming somewhat soon. So I thought, if I'm not going to speak up now, when will I ever? Uh, and perhaps my speaking up would be helpful to other librarians. So I decided to do it. But when this article was published, I started to hear from lots of other librarians who are going through the same thing. And then thankfully, other uh, outlets, other media outlets who wanted to cover uh, this type of story. So this article led to many, many, uh, much, much more coverage of the issue for which I'm very thankful. Um, in May of that year, I scheduled a meeting with my principal and I wanted to give him a heads up about where the censorship situation was likely to head in the next several months. And as part of that conversation, he chose to tell me that he believed I had gone way overboard, his words, in supporting LGBTQ plus students. Uh, okay. In June, <laughs> the next month, um, the very same LGBTQ plus students I had gone way overboard in defending were honored uh, by the New Jersey Library Association with their the Intellectual Freedom Award for their, ex, their significant role in defending the books. And here you see three of my students, Max Moore, Alex Ford, and Mitchell DaCosta, accepting that award in Atlantic City. And I can tell you without a syllable of a lie that that was the proudest night of my career as a librarian. I'm just so, so proud of those kids. There was supposed to be a fourth student there accepting that award that night a kid named Jax and Jax texted me on the day and said that they couldn't get down to Atlantic City because there was a, a family uh, medical emergency. So sadly, Jax was not there with us that night. Um, and sadly, Jax is not here with us now because in October, a year ago, uh, Jax took their own life. Jax was an amazing student leader Jax was a trans student and Jax struggled to be in this world. And I, I often wonder if being there in Atlantic City that night and having that ballroom of librarians leap to their feet and, and shout their, their praise as they did for these kids, if that could have given Jax just any, any more reason to hold on. While that was happening, uh, there was a Board of Education election taking place. And three of the people who were involved in the effort to ban the books were running for Board of Education. One of them now sits on our board, Nicole Gallo. And she was sworn onto the board in January. What these people didn't realize though, these book banners, is when they started all this, they unleashed a dragon, a dragon who is speaking to you now. And what this started was nonstop advocacy on my part. Um, over the last year and a half, I have given more than 50 presentations to community groups, educators, library groups, uh, folks such as yourself, and I'm happy to do it. Uh, as I said, I see retirement on the horizon and I really want to help clean up this mess before I hang up my hat. So if I had to put a moral to this story, um, which is a story of a very difficult and dark journey, uh, it would be in the words of Winston Churchill, uh, when you're going through hell, just keep going. <laughs> and that's what I continue to do. So I'm going to thank you for your very kind attention and turn things over to my dear friend and colleague, Amy Penwell. Thank you very much, Martha. Really inspiring, yeah. Yeah, so I met Martha in 2019 after her first round of censorship. And um, there's a number of us who were in that conference session who can say that we were radicalized by Martha Hickson. And none of us realized that she was just getting started. Um, and I just have to say, the there isn't anything that informs my advocacy work more than what she's done. And there's, I mean, Martha has taken this horrible situation and made it into her superpower. 
So it's a, um, you know, it's an honor to work with her and, you know, attempt to, you know, be inspired by her, be, um, do anything that we can to, to help. So that's, that's where I come from. Um, my name is Amy. I am a school librarian now for 14 years. I work in a different environment than Martha. I'm in a K to eight school. So I deal with children from ages four to 14. So they take they go from being kind of gooey to being, you know, just interesting little pre people, you know, just figuring out who they are and, and where they want to be. Um, I was, as I said, very inspired to support librarians uh, because of what I saw not only happening in the in our school library community, but also by the work that that Martha was doing. Um, so when Tristina, who was our advocacy chair for the New Jersey Association of School Librarians, said, "I really think we need to organize some." like a boots on the ground local effort. Because of the way New Jersey schools are organized, there's hundreds of districts. Every town just about has their own school district, meaning that there were potentially hundreds of librarians dealing with hundreds of challenges. And you know, as Martha's story tells you, it's not easy and it's very difficult to face alone. So we developed the concept for the regional response team which was a network of librarians, um, friends of libraries, people who wanted to be involved. So the, the goal for us as a state organization was to you know, find those people, build some relationships and encourage people to become active. Um, typically school board meetings are, you know, with the occasional meeting to honor student achievement or celebrate you know, whatever, you know, the student theatrical production or the, the band or whatever, that's um, very dull. Not a lot of people come out until they do. And so getting those people ready to be there at board meetings and stand up for the right to read became the primary motive and the goal for the regional response team. Um, we noticed a couple of things right away. I took Martha's list of the five books that were challenged in her library. And no surprise, they are some of the top contenders on the ALA challenge titles. What we what we see and what we know is that the same it's the same books that are challenged and quite often those challenges are coordinated by the same groups. You know, they have influence that they exert locally. So the the question of what book will be next really wasn't that hard to figure out because the list wasn't that long. Um, what we know also is that sexual content or concerns about sexual content, meaning LGBTQ content, drove more than 60% of those challenges, which the, with the balance being any books that had themes of social justice, um, an accurate telling of history, and anything that featured an, an LGBTQ main character having anything that resembles a normal looking life. So our work became very focused on creating the relationships, getting people activated, but also sharing what we knew about what was happening with book challenges. So we also looked for help um, and we stayed looking in New Jersey. We looked at our two professional library organizations, which is our association of school librarians also the State Association of Librarians. And JLA and NJSL have always had a relationship. Um, we brought our two intellectual freedom groups together and our advocacy groups together to focus on um, talking very closely about creating the regional response team. And you know, no surprise, both groups were involved. We also reached out to our non-library professional organizations. Uh, the New Jersey Association of Education has been a little slower off the block, but at the state level, very, very supportive. Um, their membership, is, their organization is distributed and they have lots of things to deal with. So uh, we've worked very hard to make sure that we stay on their radar and um, you know, repeatedly show that through Martha's work and the work of lots of librarians who will never be known or named for what they've done, 
um, demonstrated our professionalism and our commitment to students. Organizations like Garden State Equality and GLSEN are organizations that are LGBTQ advocates um, oh, or other professional organization. My logos are a little misaligned. Um, we were able to make a relationship with the Association of New Jersey Principals and Supervisors because we realized that in many situations, excuse me, um, administrators in buildings played a vital role in not only supporting librarians, but also understanding their role in supporting students. So making a relationship with that organization has helped us spread our message rather than librarian to an administrator individually, but so that they can provide training to their members because the more we just figured the more points of entry for hearing the message of students' right to read, the importance of supporting LGBTQ youth, the importance of being honest about our history, particularly where African-American students are concerned, needed to come from more than one place. And if it's just the librarians telling the story, we're very easy to ignore. We also partnered with um, ACLU New Jersey, the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, they to my knowledge, and Martha and Christina jump in if I'm wrong about this, um, legal action specifically against, well, I can't say that. They're prepared to take legal action. Their bar for action is very high, but you know this is also on their radar. And so we share information with them. And some political groups that are activists, particularly around putting pro-intellectual freedom, pro-public education candidates on school boards, organizations like um, Action Together New Jersey, Sweep NJ, which come out of one of the groups that Martha mentioned, which is that suburban woman organization, uh, Red Wine and Blue, and sharing information with people who are already politically active and want to be activated has been very, very powerful. So we created the local network of people who maybe may be willing to do things like attend school board meetings or public library board meetings um, just to be a presence so that you don't, if you're making a statement, if you're Martha, you don't feel like you're walking in to a hostile situation alone, which believe me still happens plenty, but we try to get people there. Um, our network though is primarily public librarians, school librarians. And again, it can be difficult to get, not everybody's willing to stand up and make a public statement when they feel like that may be putting a target on their back. So getting community members, um, people who are affiliated with some of the political groups, people who are affiliated with some of the more organized activist groups, um, reaching out to you know, religious organizations if it's possible, but tapping into people who are already primed to take action has been key. And also it amplifies the voice. It's not just librarians telling the story. We have a group that writes letters to the editor. Um, one of my favorite things that we've done is hold some Zoom meetings to help prepare statements to the board. Uh, one person even went so far as to hold an in-person prep rally um, I think Martha was at that meeting where people were there. They had some time to write their statement that they were going to make to the board and run it by people, you know, stand up, practice. We have a, there's a time limit generally in how much time you're given in a public meeting to make your statement and, you know, give some hints. How should you address the board? What can you expect? For a lot of people, this is their first time. It may be their first time making a public statement or uh, speaking publicly and probably their first time making a public statement to an official board. So knowing what to expect and how to act and how not to get rattled um, was part of our training efforts. We also encourage people locally to hold peaceful protests or read-ins prior to meetings if they feel safe doing so. Um, and always, if we can encourage people to speak to the local press that's very helpful. And again, it's just to counter those very loud, very small group of people who are kicking up the fuss. 
So once we know that there's a challenge situation, we can put the word out through the network. Um, we're still building that network. We don't, we're not everywhere. Like I said, there's hundreds of towns, hundreds of school districts, but we try to, we try to do what we can. What we realized also pretty quickly was that we needed a toolbox and a lot of our work as an organization was going to revolve around educating people and disseminating information. So things like, uh, you know, school board policy, unless you are on a school board or very, very intimately involved with a school board, it's sort of a, you know, it's a lockbox. People don't really think about how school boards make their decisions. They're guided by policies, which are, you know, like bylaws with legal ramifications. So every district has a policy relating to how school library materials are selected, how community complaints are handled, and those policies apply to everyone. So using Martha's story as an example, there were some things that happened in her first book challenge situation that weren't according, didn't follow policy. So making sure people are aware of that so that people at meetings and people in the community can say, but wait a minute, that's not how that was supposed to happen and hold their administrators and school board accountable is step one. Um, also countering the narrative that these books are damaging or somehow obscene or pornographic is the information on awards that books have won, testimonials from readers as to the, the impact they had on their lives. Um, so we've created a, I'd say medium sized library of book resumes, which gives you the, you know, the deep, this is a, such a librarian thing to do. It's the information on the book, the awards, it's won, the reading lists, it's on snippets and excerpts from reviews, professional reviews from people who understand where books fit in the universe of everything that's published and who these books may be written for. And nobody will tell you that every book is written for everyone. You know, every book has its reader. And sometimes those readers need to know those books are there. So the importance of seeing them on the shelf, whether they ever check them out of the library or not, but just can be that, that one moment, the tiny little speck in someone's day that says, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing to be ashamed of about me. There's books that have, that represent my story or maybe might represent the story of someone that's in my family or one of my friends. This is, this is all part of the human experience. Everything is, everything is as it should be. Um, in New Jersey, we also just moving on to other, some things in our toolbox. Our Department of Education has many requirements for inclusion of materials that support diversity and inclusion, African-American history, the Holocaust, social emotional learning, relationships, LGBTQ and disabled contributions. Weirdly, we limit it to science and social studies, but that's kind of a, that's a New Jersey thing. Um, to help answer the, the charge that these, you know, obscene materials don't support the curriculum. Yes, they do. And just the other day, I was having an interesting conversation with a good friend of mine about a book in her middle school library. Um, how did this book get in the library? And it wasn't a book that I knew of, but as soon as she started describing it to me, you know, we looked it up, we found the professional reviews and was like, I can tell you three different ways this fits in the curriculum. And it's a library book. If your kid doesn't want to read this and this poetry anthology about growing up LGBTQ, then they don't have, nobody's making them. So, you know, getting that, again, just reinforcing that message and supporting the literary quality of the books that every school librarian is charged with selecting. You know, none of us have a budget that's so big that we can afford to buy garbage. We're looking for the cream of the crop, the best of the best, and things that support our curriculum things that will encourage student reading and supports their, you know, goes to the things that we know they are interested in because we know our students, things that we have the money for. And then it goes through two more layers of approval. Our administrators approve it and the school board approves it. 
So to say that something got on the school library shelf that is, you know, garbage or any other pejorative term you can throw at it, just, it can't be true. You know, we, we buy from state approved vendors who, who sell books printed by mainstream publishers. Nobody in those worlds publish things that fit the categories that the book banners want to place them in. Um, the last thing in our toolbox is providing direct support to people for board meetings. As I said before, you know, coaching folks on how to address the board and what to expect at meetings. Um, I can't think of anything else that's in our toolbox right now, but it's what we realize is that there's a lot of, as Martha said, there's, if you haven't gone through this, if you don't know the policies, if you don't know, have at your fingertips, you know, what does the Department of Education require? It can be very hard to talk back to some of the charges that are coming about books because they involve a lot of what we in America call pearl clutching, like, oh no, protect our children. And being a voice of reason to counter that very scary narrative is, it requires information and it requires a little bit of skill, um, a little bit of desensitization also to not react when someone is coming at you very reactively. So using the information that we as librarians know and that we you know, go out to get when we need, putting together the things that we can then hand over to you know, someone who may be considering running for school board or is running for school board and wants to make a statement to the board or a parent of a child who you know, knows what they know about what's important to support for their child, for their child's friends, for their school community, you know, not wanting to see books removed from the shelves and going down that slippery slope, but how can they counter some of the charges that are coming from the groups like Moms for Liberty and the, you know, the hate and the, the information that they're disseminating. So we prefer to counter with facts and information to prepare them. The most important Thank thing. You. Thank you very much, sorry, Amy. I think we need to, to move on. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that's just it. We want people to know, then librarians specifically, to know that they are, they're supported. So, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. We're running short of time. So that's, I'm sorry, I had to interrupt a bit. Not at all. Not at all. It was good timing. Yeah. So, Tresina, can you please continue? Sure, thank you so much, Amy. I appreciate your presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and share out my slideshow. Um, I just wanted to you know, touch upon what Amy and Mar Martha share with you. Um, and hello, Sweden. It's a good morning to us, but a good afternoon to you. And I appreciate Linda and Peter having us here today um, and to speak about some of the ongoing issues throughout the, the United States of America. Happy Banned Book Week to all. But my name is Tristina Strong Beebe, and I'm the advocacy chair for the New Jersey Association of School Librarians. <clears throat> I specifically came into this position in 2018 due to the lack of school librarians in our state. Throughout our state, we had a 20% decrease. And my initial position was to ensure that school librarians were in place uh, throughout the state. And unfortunately, in about 2021, as Martha stated, my position pivoted to some of the issues that we were having with banned books, censorship, and um, ensuring that students had the right to read. Um, I never envision, envisioned that this would be where our advocacy was going to spin to. And I realized quickly in my position in the state of New Jersey that we needed to branch out. We have very uh, unique demographic areas. We have over 600 members in our association, and we have rural, we have suburban, and we have inner city locations. Originally, I wanted to do a north, south, uh, central, and Jersey Shore, as we call our ocean location. Um, but with the issues with book banning happen, happening so rapidly, we recognized that we needed to pivot quickly. Originally, it wasn't the regional response team, it was a rapid regional response team because we wanted to rapidly respond to some of these issues that pretty much were happening overnight. 
But in speaking with you today, please keep in mind that most of my discussion points are around school libraries and not necessarily public ch library challenges. But sadly, we are seeing challenges in both school and public libraries across the nation. And I come to you with over 15 years of experience having worked in public libraries and academic uh, library as well. Um, and now I'm, I'm a kindergarten through eighth grade school librarian for the last eight years. But some of the topics that we haven't mentioned um, specifically, and you know, Martha kind of touched upon this, was the mental health and wellness of our school librarians and our students. Um, this has been something that has been an increased need for our libraries. Have found them librarians have found themselves in these situations, and we don't always talk about the mental health of our students that may feel dismissed. Um, unseen with these decisions, these decisions that are happening at highly charged Board of Ed meetings uh, brought about in schools, social media, and now even the newspapers. And in turn, our agency just recently purchased liability insurance, and that was to help the advocates, especially the two who are on this meeting, but to make sure that we can uphold and defend our American Library Association's Right to Read Intellectual Freedom Act. And the Intellectual Freedom Act specifically recognizes the rights of library users to read, seek information, and speak freely. Um, I also want to touch upon it, that it's the core part of our profession. It's the core value of our profession. Now, I know I'm limited on time, but I just want to go in. I know that Amy touched upon that we do have, in a sense, we are very advantageous as a state. I almost feel a little bit of guilt presenting to you. And in hearing Martha's horrific story, we actually sit very strongly amongst our states across the nation. We have student learning standards in New Jersey that mandate and support diverse materials. So for instance, we have our Amistad Commission um, that actually requires uh, at the teaching of information on African slave trade and information about Africans throughout this, the country. Our LGBTQ law, which was inducted in 2019, uh, was also the first in the nation state to require students to learn about the societal and historical contributions of LGBTQ figures. And we also have our diversity and inclusion bill that was passed in 2021, and that highlights and promotes diversity. But one of the topics that we haven't talked about is soft censorship. And I'm not sure if this is a term that has made it to Sweden, and I'm sure Penn, America, Penn has, is aware of this. But this is an area where materials may be purposefully removed or limited or never even purchased at all through school librarians or through a district, despite it being a book or a resource that would serve students that would showcase multiple perspectives or might highlight marginalized groups. So it's hard to have a definite number when we report some of these facts and figures to you about the book bans in our state and across the nation due to soft censorship. Um, we're not always following policies. We don't always have school districts that have policies in place. And we continue to advocate and to ensure that there is a proper process. So we do know that our numbers are much higher um, than we are reporting. And this can, in turn, silence voices, exclude people or groups, limit conversation, cause isolation and exclusion, and dismiss varying perspectives. Um, I think this is something to be said, and you know, Martha's uh, story is really core uh, to how this can affect um, students and librarians. So our state of New Jersey, as I st stated earlier, we actually have over 600 members in our Association for School Librarians. So I'm really proud and fortunate to be the advocacy lead. But um, in the past two years, um, just, you know, kind of like back, based on some of the data that we've collected, we had more than 20 attempts to restrict access to almost 30 book titles. And early on in our advocacy, we actually contacted ALA. We would turn over letters to school districts. We had a template a letter that we would send out as our agency, and we worked hand in hand with our public librarian agency, New Jersey Library Association. So we had, you know, letters to go out to different districts, but Again, we realized that it was very rapid and we needed to respond quickly. But the good news is there is a pending bill. It mimics Illinois's uh, bill, which is called the Right to Read Bill. It was just recently introduced um, by our state senator and also our state senator majority leader that would pool state funding from public schools and libraries that do choose to ban books. And uh, currently it's right before the state uh, Senate Education Committee. I'll have this slide available as an extra resource 
resource at the end. And I know Martha had a really great newsletter takeaway. I'm not sure, Linda, if you have a copy of that to share. But um, this bill actually mimics Illinois's legislation that took effect and will actually um, take place on uh, in January 1st of 2024. Um, this bill is the first in the nation, so I have Illinois. I'll only be able to spotlight a few nations, but I do want to make sure I call out a few that are pretty um, uh, impactful right now. But this bill will outlaw book bans and it protects the freedom of libraries to acquire materials without external limitations. And prior to this bill, Illinois law did not actually provide anything. So um, this is a pretty um, important bill that Illinois got on under underway. So this is a really great map, uh, PEN America stats. And if you actually click on the map, I can kind of showcase this really quickly. Um, but this is our United States PEN org um, issues and you can actually browse the index. And one of the pretty significant facts when you browse the index is that pretty much every single policy that has been brought upon um, book banning has been polarized um, and has rep been represented by specifically the Republican Party. Um, I was going through the entire database trying to see if there's maybe some type of bipartisan, but if you do look at it, um, there is a close tie to that. And I'm just, you know, bringing out some of the data specific to, to that information. But this past year, um, some of the pen um, shares that the instances of book bans were most prevalent in Texas, Texas, Florida, Missouri, Utah, and South Carolina. Um, so as amid a growing climate of censorship, school book bans continue to spread uh, through coordinated campaigns. I know we've mentioned Moms for Liberty, um, but it is usually a vocal minority, but they have a database of talking points and they have a database of book selections. And they are the same um, talking points that continuously you know, show up and flare uh, some pressure to state legislation. Um, some of the key findings is over 40% of all the book bans occurred in school districts in Florida. Across 33 school districts, PEN America recorded 1,406 uh, book bans in Florida alone, followed by 625 in Texas. And some of these, these, these you know, have to be updated. I'm going to move on to a couple um, rough uh, states, as we would call them, with book banning, but specifically Florida, <clears throat> who does have a governor behind a lot of this, um, and from, you know, this, some of the issues that they're having there. But um, Florida has made it nearly impossible for librarians to operate. If I had some visuals, you would see shelves without books. Um, they have actually uh, housed books um, with covers on them until they could be appropriately approved. Um, they have signed into law several constraints that do not defend a student's right to read. And the current governor has actually created the anti-woke or stop woke law, which prohibits schools and companies from leveling guilt or blame to students and employees based on race or sex. It also instructs students not to feel guilt or anguish or any other type of psychological distress, and it has a limited information within books. Uh, this law has been challenged recently by the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression and the American Civil Liberties Union, both in Florida and nationwide, as well as the Legal Defense uh, Fund. But if you were to check uh, the governor's website, he talks about, um, quote, some are attempting to use our schools for indoctrination. And in Florida, pornographic and inappropriate materials have been snuck into our classrooms and libraries to sexualize our students, and they violate our state education standards. Florida is the educational state that has, means providing students with a quality education. And the Florida commissioner recently said that education is about the pursuit of truth and not woke indoctrination. He also has has a parental rights in education or the don't say gay bill, which has created a demolishing effect on what materials may or may not be used or discussed in school libraries. So I wanted to um, share that information out with you. I do have two pages on them. Um, there could probably be a lot more material on that. The education bill also is used um, by public K-12 schools. Uh, the governor is quick to sign these bills and um, pretty much says that sex is biological, stable, and determined at birth. School employees may not use the personal pronouns, and if they do use such personal pronouns, they have to con uh, correspond with their biological sex. Uh, they also go on to talk about classroom instruction and sexual orientation or gender identity may not take place in uh, specific grade ranges, and the list goes on. If you've been following this closely, um, there have been ongoing issues. Uh, 
some specific anecdotal anecdotal um, information I can share is I actually have a sister who is a professor in Florida. Her brother, uh, her her husband, and herself both have children, and uh, they work in higher education. But they mentioned that the Moms for Liberty group, which is a highly orchestrated and well funded um, group, is um, has been recently been titled a hate group. Um, and they have members of their recently members of their ethics committee were appointed. Um, one of their leaders actually was appointed to this governor's um, state of Florida ethics commission. So it's a little ironic, but she does unfortunately report that Florida is now demolishing access to school-based therapists, removing books from shelves and creating an atmosphere where teachers and librarians are not returning to their jobs. They've also had a 25% decrease in their faculty in Florida universities due to some of these um, issues with not being able to actually portray Black Lives uh, Matter stickers or pride flags or uh, personal pronouns. So it is it is pretty dire in the state of Florida um, for some of the reports that we've been having from our colleagues as well. We move on to Texas because everything is bigger in Texas, even their book bans. So uh, the Texas Tribune uh, does report that in 2022, unfortunately, they have had quite a few um, Book bannings, um, they had over 801 books across 22 school districts that were banned um, in October of 2021. The Texas State Representative actually sent a list of 850 books to be looked at, and they now have their Reader Act, and they have been working tire tirelessly to try to conduct research with um, some of the information to our uh, our vendors across the nation that provide books to mandate that these books are being addressed and um, they can prohibit these or they can actually assign ratings to books. So that has kind of been an ongoing issue in Texas. And I'm going to go ahead and just kind of flash through. I can share this out at the end if you want to hear more about it. But probably uh, the most appalling information that I've heard more recently is that South Carolina actually disbanded their board of their education committee from the school librarian associations committee stating that students well-being and parental satisfaction are opposing interests and as a result they continue uh, this the department of education will formally discontinue any partnership with south carolina's association association of school librarians so very um, disheartening information across the state um, I also have Utah in there. I do want to mention key findings that book bans in K-12 schools do continue to increase, sadly. Um, and over 40% of all book bans have occurred in Florida, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I do want to mention that there are some good news. Um, Georgia has jailed the librarian bill, which is stalled recently. Um, it was not passed in the Georgia General Assembly. Nebraska was attempting to place constraints, and they both um, those bills were both stopped. And in our conversation earlier, I did add about our Brooklyn Public Library. So they actually have their unbanned library that is able to have access for students 13 to 21 anywhere in the nation. Um, they can actually sign up for a digital library card and have full access to all banned books. Um, and they have been crucial partners in defending and expanding the freedom to read. So I did want to share that out with you and I really I'm sorry if I spoke quickly I, I've been working on that as an American in in the East Coast but I wanted to um, get all that information for you and we will be more than happy to share our resources with you as well thank you oh thank you very much Tristina and thank you to you all you are very inspirational to all of us and we're very happy for the work you've been doing uh, martha maybe you can tell us a bit you, you were you were awarded weren't you can you tell us a short about that well that's one of the other things that the book banners didn't expect um, and i think it drives them crazy and i love it um but yes i've received some very nice um honors uh including the Lemony Snicket Prize for Noble Librarians Faced with Adversity, presented to me by Daniel Handler himself at last year's ALA conference, and uh, the Judith Krug uh, Outstanding Librarian Award from the National Coalition Against Censorship. And if Judith Krug is not a name familiar to you, she is the American librarian who started Banned Books Week here in 1982. Great. So thank you. Do we have any questions, Linda? I think we have some some minutes for that. Uh, yeah, let me see. I haven't <laughs> typing here. Let's see. 
for the same lots of thank yous you're inspirational and I was thinking this this Brooklyn initiative with the the uh, the digital site there. Uh, do you know how how much it's is used by students from elsewhere? It's received now anyone? Yeah, you know what I'm I as far as I know they did a really great job of of releasing this and coordinating this effort and I know they've been working across the nation to get the word out. Um I'm not sure of the usage. I can find that information out. I do know that it's a free library card for students 13 to 21. Um and they have a website and they I think they have a pretty strong Instagram account. Um so they're very fashionable. Brooklyn uh library is very fashionable for our youth and uh they've had a really, you know, I think I think I'm looking here that according to September of last year, over 5,100 free library cards have gone out, and that was in September of 2022. So I'm, I'm curious to know how much it has increased. I'm also curious to know how many school librarians and school districts have shared this information out. Uh, students are pretty savvy, though, so hopefully they've been able to have access to that. Um, it also goes into our digital divide of whether or not they'll have access to Wi-Fi, phones, and, and accessibility. At least one school librarian in Oklahoma shared information about the access to the Brooklyn Library card and was yes. fired as a result. She That's now right. works for the Brooklyn Public Library. That's right. Did you want to give them a little bit of information on that, Martha? Because we actually talked about it earlier. Because we, we do have so many champions across the state, but Martha has banned together with a lot of them to kind of share out some stories. But I know we've had quite significant issues with, with some of our school librarians. Yeah, the, the one I've been working with most closely is in uh, Roxbury, New Jersey, which is just north of me. And she, her story is almost identical to mine, but um, I would say, and Amy might agree, like even worse. <laughs> uh, um, and she is actually suing um, the people who made the false claims against her for defamation. Fortunately, her husband's an attorney. <laughs> yeah. We Other have, questions, yes, Linda. Yeah. Yes, we have one, uh, one or two questions. So, what are the typical reasons for soft censorship, and how can we work against it? Because so that, I think, is something we experience here in Sweden as well. That's that's a great, great question. I think, um, unfortunately, it's probably mainly fear, um, having to be front and center. I mean, Martha really took it. She's like the queen of front and center. She was able to really handle that eloquently but oftentimes and as the advocacy chair in the state of New Jersey it used to be fear of job loss and now it's fear of you know having your name slandered and having to deal with some of the the mental anguish and not feeling like you're supported in your own school district and with educators um, I think so soft censorship is really something that you know for someone who might not be very comfortable dealing with um, being in the spotlight and having to defend the right to read or not feeling like you have a, a community of teammates. Um, that's pretty much the main reason why we figured out we would do our rapid response team because we wanted to have power in numbers. You know, we wanted to offer talking points. We normally have Zoom meetings ahead of time. Amy's, you know, and, you know, every library we would have to really give a lot of credit to, you know, they would have online, um, you know, options to actually write in or contact legislators. So I think fear would you say would be the main cause martha and amy if you want to chime in Absolutely. i agree yeah and among the ways to to combat it are um you know just being very deliberate in your um book selections making sure that you are following any established policies or processes uh, making sure that you are following your selection criteria and uh, we all know that we read you know thousands of book reviews in any given month. Uh, and we are reading book reviews from pro professional sources. So just making sure that you have those uh, book reviews to, to back you up. Um, and just to throw some data behind this, School Library Journal has uh, asked this question two years in a row now. Uh, last year, roughly 40% of school librarians admitted to having engaged in soft censorship, either by quietly removing a book from the shelves themselves 
or choosing not to buy a book in the first place. This year, they conducted the ask the same question, and it's up to roughly, I think, 46% of librarians, school librarians now, say they have engaged in soft censorship. And that's just the proportion who admit it. So I think the number is even higher. And I probably want to add on that even administrators and board members have a play in that as well. You know, I've I've uh, actually sat with book fairs where books have been pulled based on the cover or title through our, our PTO, which isn't under my control, but it's you know f you know under the control of a different grouping. So I think you know it's kind of like they don't want to deal with with this challenges that might come about. So I think that that's probably another issue that it's not just the librarian, it's now the administrator, it's now board members, and it's kind of like a trickling effect. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, do you see any decrease in uh, students? Uh, do they dare become librarians again? Or, or, <laughs> or, or do you see people, are there still students at the librarian? becoming librarians have you any I, I could speak on this uh, in regards to, I actually teach uh, as an adjunct, adjunct professor. So I think our students are very highly charged and um, really, you know, excited about the profession because they want to defend the right to read and they they see um, how libraries are the best social service that we can offer our public. You know, it's, it's recreational reading, it's uh, student development. Um, so I feel that I don't know that there's so many students being withdrawn. I do think that current educators might feel that way because of just everything post COVID coupled with this. Um, but I don't, I'm hoping that we can inspire them. What are your, what, Martha and Amy, what are your thoughts? In terms of uh, graduate students preparing to be librarians, I think it's an interesting time for that. Um, I think that we're in a little bit of a loop because in New Jersey, there has been quite a bit of job loss for school librarians, which would tend to depress the number of students interested in entering the field. Um, but for sure, the ones who are now, um, you know, it's not a, it's not an easy time. So you, I think people need to be pretty committed and that's encouraging to see, you know, we need strong, articulate librarians who understand the you know the full circle of their responsibilities and standing up for your students and seeing your students um is a big part of that so it's to me that makes it exciting and you know, that i can really feel like that's a place to make a difference and i would add that i get invited to speak to um at Rutgers, uh, our state university here in New Jersey, which has a very strong school library program. I get invited to speak to their uh, library classes pretty regularly, and I have yet to speak to an empty class, <laughs> so they're still there. But on the other end of the career spectrum, I think that uh, the current situation is um, an invitation for uh, experienced librarians to consider uh, advancing their retirement plans, perhaps at a date earlier than they would have done so previously, including the one now speaking. Mm. So uh, although we do have new librarians entering the profession, the veterans are choosing to leave. Mm. Thank you. I think that's all the questions from the chat. Um... Yeah. One one last thing I, I was thinking your your banned books week in the in the U.S. How how is it going? Is it uh, getting better or worse with the with the book bans in large in your country? Um, data wise, I don't see that there's improvement. In fact, both Pen America and uh, the ALA released data within the last ten days showing that we are on track to probably break <laughs> last year's record setting numbers yet again. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be slowing down or improving greatly. On the other hand, I would say that the mainstream media is finally starting to pay much more attention and give much more coverage to the issue. Um, in fact, a, an outlet as um, kind of anodyne and mainstream as USA Today uh, just released in the last couple of days uh, a very extensive article about Bombs for Liberty and its fake 
book review database known as Book Looks. And it was uh, an excellent, excellent article that I think will open a lot of eyes about the orchestrated nature of what's going on. Um, so I think that kind of daylight on the issue can be potentially helpful. Okay, thank you very much for for this uh, interesting conversation and talk. We can continue for a lot of time, I think, but we unfortunately have to, to end here. Thank you very much, Jens Singmark, David Isaac Library, Anna Nordell, Swedish Pen, Christina Strong Baby, Amy Penwell, and Martha Hickson from New Jersey. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.